This is a panel discussion looking at the world in 2022 through the lens of integral theory and spiral dynamics. Integral is a highly influential school of thought, mostly created by the philosopher Ken Wilber back in the 90s, that tries to understand the world via cultural evolution of value systems. At the core of integral theory is the idea that cultures and societies go through specific levels of development in the same way as individuals do, becoming more sophisticated as they develop or grow up. Integral theory represents this development as a spiral. In this film, we'll mostly be talking about amber, tribalism, ethnocentric, authoritarian, which first emerged about 5,000 years ago. Orange, modern values, the rational self, that emerged 300 years ago with the liberal democracies and the beginning of universal values. Green, the values of relativism, multiple perspectives, dialogue and consensus, human rights, sometimes called postmodern, which emerged fully in the 1960s. If they're healthily integrated, they support each other, but each of them can believe that their way of looking at the world is the only true way, and then they are mutually exclusive. For Wilbur, the incomprehension between these worldviews is what's causing many of the worst excesses of the culture wars. Above these levels, Wilbur says, is another level called integral or second tier. From this perspective, it's clear that each of the previous ways of seeing the world has value and needs to be integrated. For this conversation and Q&A in the Rebel Wisdom Digital Campfire, we were joined by meditator and mediator Diane Musho Hamilton, the host of the Daily Evolver podcast, Jeff Salzman, and the author of Developmental Politics, Steve McIntosh. We talked about where the intellectual dark web fell short. We see Jordan Peterson, right? He, you know, he, he's one of the first people who's, who's not, at least at the time, identifiably on the right. You know, he seemed to be kind of center left. Uh, and, and, you know, as a professor at the University of Toronto and a Jungian, you know, he, he had this kind of refreshing refusal to accept what he saw as the tyranny of, of emerging progressive culture. And, and all of us could feel that he was able to channel it in a way that was very exciting. That, of course, led many others to identify with him and, and um, surf the momentum of that. But because it, it, this, this, the, the critique of progressivism was primarily negative and didn't stake out what came next, it was perhaps inevitable that uh, the movement would lose steam and important figures like uh, um, you know, Jordan Peterson would be pulled by the gravity of the right. My experiences in watching Jordan Peterson, because, because he is, you know, he's a very perceptive person and his, he's deeply committed to, you know, his work and his research, but he, he really does lack a both and. I mean, there's just no question that when I listen to him, I, I experience the either or, and he seems not to be able to pace the truths of Green and asked to go a step further, but it becomes a, you know, it becomes a, a duality of for and again. And how the different value systems responded to the challenge of the pandemic. To the degree that they're traditionalists, they are, that's the stage of development that out of which this idea that sovereignty rises in my breast, that I am not subject to the king, I'm not subject to anybody. And so that's just a natural antipathy. And I grew up with these people, they hate the government. So then there's the modernists. Um, and, uh, you know, the modernist, thank God for the modernist, because it's the first stage of development where winner doesn't take all, you know, where we actually create structures where we can fight it out. And so we do. And, and then there's the, the, uh, the stage of development that uh, as we move into green, green so again, has this antipathy to modernism. They don't like this individual, um, certainly don't like uh, capitalism. And so for them, there's a natural affinity to government power. Diane is one of the teachers on our upcoming Sensemaking 101 course, which starts in February. Check the show notes for more details and hope you enjoy the conversation. So welcome everybody to the first big panel event of 2022 and I'm really there's a lot of excitement already in the chat and I'd like to add to that I'm really excited about this tonight I know 
that our guests, Jeff, Diane, and Steve have already put a lot of thought into, into this, which is fantastic. There's a lot of people in the audience who are enthusiastic about integral theory. It's been a kind of thread that's run through Rebel Wisdom since the beginning. It had a big impact on both Ali and I in, I think it was 2017, when the Trump and a Post-Truth World book was released, the ebook that came out shortly after the Trump election. And we both read it. And for me, it was the first time that I'd really understood integral as applied to current politics. And it kind of felt like a bit of a light bulb moment. And I still think it's one of the most effective and powerful frameworks for understanding current dynamics, which is what we're going to dig into here and apply it to 2022. And yeah, really pleased to be joined by Jeff Salzman, the host of the Daily Evolver podcast. Diane Musher Hamilton, a meditator and mediator and longtime friend of Rebel Wisdom. And making his debut on Rebel Wisdom, Steve McIntosh, uh, author of Developmental Politics. So welcome all three of you. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, David. And this wonderful group. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. It's going to be interesting, and I'm looking forward to the conversation, David. Fantastic. So we will we'll have a, a three-way, four-way conversation for about an hour or so, and then they'll, we'll open up to questions. So in a second, I'll put the Q&A sheet into the chat, and then welcome to add to that. You can upvote any questions there that you particularly like. And yeah, we'll segue on to the, the Q&A portion after about an hour. So maybe let's begin with asking if, if you could each just introduce yourselves and give a very brief, um, yeah, very brief history of your kind of interest in integral theory and why you feel that it's relevant. And then we'll, we'll move on to whether it's still relevant in 2022. Jeff, would you like to, to lead us off? Yeah. Um... Yeah, Jeff Salzman here. I I, I uh, came upon integral theory uh, probably 25 years ago or so, a long time ago, when I ran into a Ken Wilber book in the bookstore that said Up From Eden. And that was a transformation just reading that title for me. Because I had, I've always been a seeker and so forth, but I saw this idea, and this was confirmed in the book, that we haven't fallen from paradise as humanity. We are rising to paradise. We are definitely in a process of evolution, cultural evolution and consciousness evolution. And that became a psychoactive realization for me. And it changed me. And it helped me to befriend the world in a way that I hadn't before. And to see the simplicity behind the complexity when you see the whole cosmos, basically as a living enchanted system that we're part of, that's living us, that we're living. And, um, and then I got hooked up through a series of coincidences with the Integral Institute. And I have been, um, you know, an integral advocate for uh, about 20 years. I start, started the Boulder Integral Center and I do the Daily Evolver podcast. And that pretty much brings me up to date. Awesome. And I meant to say before I uh, introduce you, Jeff, when we first spoke, you've been on the channel before, I think, yeah. a couple of times. And when we first spoke, you'd just seen the original glitch in the Matrix film. And you said, I watched it and it was it was integral. It was it was an integral film. Yes. And what was fascinating is that I, I'd i actually recorded a section based on Trump and the post-truth world and not put it into the film. But somehow it had all... It, it still made its way in just in the framing of the of of yeah what did make it into the film yeah there's a certain flavor to things at integral mm. yeah. and maybe we can yeah we can ask everyone yeah, what it's, it's the, what, the what they think to... inter integral tastes like yes exactly <laughs> awesome diane Yeah, I, can, I came from a, a, a different angle. I had not done a lot of reading of Ken Wilber. I actually had read only one book of his, um, the book that he wrote about the experience he had of his wife and, and uh, her passing called Grace and Grit, which maybe a number of you have read on the call. Um, 
but what happened for me is that I was doing a lot of work, believe it or not, 20 years ago in the, in the, really the nineties. Um, and for instance, I was, I was facilitating as a mediator, lots of conversations related to race. I was working on the racial unfairness task force and I was experiencing what now I see were developmental challenges in the people I was working with, particularly in terms of their ability to take perspectives. You would see, I would see people not able to relate to the conversations. I'd see people who were angry, people who were you know, reticent, participating people who were bummed out. And then these amazing people that seemed to be resilient. And I, I got very interested in that. And I was introduced to Ken's work more formally right in there. And that was literally like three weeks after I started to formulate this question about kind of stage development. And I started using Elizabeth Kubler's Ross's, Ross's stages of grief to explain what I was seeing. So it's the first time I thought about a stage model. Then I was introduced to Ken. And very shortly after that, I met him in person. Then Jeff hired me. And, and actually I went to work for the Integral Institute, not being very well educated in integral theory, but having a, an instinct for what we might call integral consciousness, which is a, you know, a, a particular kind of stage development. And my job at Integral Institute was really to take some of Ken's concepts and to see if I could help design exercises and, and processes to bring those concepts into experience. So for me, it was all about, you know, how can this really be applied? And my, and I kind of stumbled into it and, and it really helped me in my work as a mediator and a facilitator. And also it helped me resolve some questions around spiritual practice. And, and uh, I was able to make some kinds of distinctions using this very comprehensive map that I hadn't been able to make before. So it was just super helpful to me. So that, that's my background, David. And then, of course, I've learned much more just by being in the company of all these people, uh, Steve, Jeff, Nomali, others who've been very involved in, in uh, integral, inter the integral enterprise, if you will. Awesome. So, Steve, welcome to Rebel Wisdom. What's your background? Thanks in very much, David. Work? Well, per, per, most of my life, ever since the 1970s, I've been fascinated by the periods in history in which renaissances occurred or, you know, emergences, enlightenments, all the various uh, times when culture accelerated uh, in a positive way throughout human history. And uh, this led me to be specifically interested in um, uh, the, the arts and where science and spirituality had some interesting overlap or challenge. I was a, a big fan of uh, Pierre Thierry de Chardin. Um, and then in 1999, um, I discovered this book, Spiral Dynamics, uh, which really opened my eyes to this progressive postmodern worldview, you know, what uh, sometimes referred to in the jargon as green. Um, through this, I was invited to join the Integral Institute in 2000. I was one of the original members. Um, and I learned a lot from Ken Wilber. I certainly uh, honor his work. Uh, but by 2002, I began to realize that. Um, that he had quite a few things I disagreed with and that I thought he was making some philosophical mistakes as well as some uh, good insights as well. And so 2002, I left uh, the Integral Institute on good terms and decided I, would, uh, I was called to make an independent contribution um, to this emerging way of seeing things, which led to my first book in 2007, Integral Consciousness. Um, I've since written three more books um, on integral philosophy, the latest being um, Developmental Politics, How America Can Grow Into a Better Version of Itself. And also since 2013, I've been um, the co-founder and president of a, an emerging think tank, the Institute for Cultural Evolution, which focuses on uh, hyperpolarization, primarily in American politics, but obviously um, much of the, the thinking and writing that we do applies to what's going on in politics in the UK. So um, that's where I am now, uh, institution building and continuing my writing. And um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Awesome. So as I said, um, Jeff, Diane, Steve have all kind of worked out their framing thoughts for this. So Jeff, do you think, I've got your notes here. Do you think if you wanted to, should we go from you to Di to Steve? Uh, in, in that order with the explanation of integral, the experience of integral consciousness and then development applied to politics. That yeah, feels like yeah. a... That works, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just lay out the you know, basic principles of integral philosophy. And, and again, it's, it's this idea that 
consciousness and culture evolve. So consciousness is the individual aspect of that. Culture is the collective. And that there have been several discernible stages of cultural evolution in human history. And there are three of those stages online right now in the developed world. There's more, there's previous ones and there's later ones. But the three online that are traditionalism, and this is the, the God and country people. There is modernism, and these are the urban, world-centric, secular people. They each has its own worldview. And then the postmodern progressives, and these are the people who are committed to social justice and egalitarianism and the environment, uh, gender fluidity, the animals. You know, so these these three worldviews are currently online, and they're at war with each other. They don't like each other. That's that's sort of the 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 sort of unfortunate part of evolution is that it likes um, fighting. It also likes friending, but it really likes fighting too. And so these people naturally think that each of their, their worldview is the correct one. And they have set out to remake the world in their image. And that's, that, you know, that's a, that goes a long way to understanding what's going on with the culture wars, uh, the actual wars, you know, in the planet. And, you know, the meaning crisis, the environmental crisis, it's all illuminated when you see it as part of this living system. And of course, the fun part is that evolution continues into this new post postmodern stage that we're calling integral. And, um, and the key characteristic of this new stage of development is the ability to see, appreciate, and operate from the various worldviews. And, um, you know, and, and, and we can see this emerging culture arising, whether or not people understand integral theory. And, and it's people who are, you know, maybe 5% in the developed world, I don't know, 7%, who are, they're just tired of right fighting for, for their ideology. And they suspect that their side has blind spots and that their sworn enemies might have a point, you know? So there's this impulse to integrate. And um, I guess I'll stop there and die. You can talk more about, you know, different aspects of that. Yeah, I, actually, if you're, if you're willing, I might want to bat it over to Steve because I think he'll have some comments and then maybe I can pick up with a little bit talking more about the characteristics and why they're important. Steve, are you willing? Sure, of course. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I can. Um, my particular focus in this entire field right now, the place where I think that this way, this perspective, this way of seeing, um, can do the most good, is in the hyperpolarized political environment. You know, I mean, I can I can talk with authority about uh, what's going on in the United States, and that is uh, that we've become stretched out through our own growth, at least a portion of the society has grown, a portion of the society hasn't. And, and this means that we're, we're in a, a, a state in history where the minimum social solidarity for a functional democracy is being significantly threatened, right? So the United States government was set up so that there'd be compromises and checks and balances and negotiation between uh, uh, different factions for sure, but factions that all were contained within a, an ideal of, of the good of the country or some kind of minimal patriotism. And so that's been disrupted uh, but for good and bad uh, by the emergence of this uh, major worldview over the last 60 years, which we're calling the progressive postmodern worldview or just progressivism for short. Progressivism used to be used by the media to explain everything that was on the left, but as a polarity on the left has become more and more evident, not just across the left right spectrum, but within the left side of the Democratic Party in the United States, uh, the media has started to identify um, the, the more left of the left as progressivism, where with, with liberalism being uh, reserved for, you know, the more center left. So anyway, those are the terms I'll use when talking about this. So the, the, the impulse, which many of those who are working in the space of, of what's known as political reform and renewal or, or overcoming hyperpolarization, 
their, their instinct is to think about it as some kind of bad marriage. Like it's just a matter of meeting in the middle and recognizing that we're all in this together. Um, and, you know, I certainly uh, applaud that if, to the extent that it can happen, but I think that it's strategically misguided because it's, it's not a matter of meeting in the middle anymore. And that, that is, there's little common ground left to be found. So what we're working on at the Institute for Cultural Evolution is staking out what we're calling higher ground, a perspective that's kind of outside and above the culture war that can appreciate that these main, three major worldviews that Jeff mentioned form a kind of an interdependent cultural ecosystem when properly appreciated, even though they're in this process of differentiating and hating each other. Uh, that certainly could lead to a regression. There's no, um, no guarantee. But if we look at evolution uh, across the spectrum from the Big Bang, right, all the way through cosmological, biological, and now uh, cultural evolution, we can see this recurring pattern. It was first recognized by Herbert Spencer in the 1850s, and that is differentiation followed by the potential for a higher level of integration. So that higher level of integration is what this political perspective represents. And so it, 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 it's not just a perspective, it's also a method. We're working to integrate values from across the political spectrum. That is, those who are embedded within one of these worldviews see the other worldviews primarily primarily for their pathologies. And what this higher perspective we recommend does is, is that it's able to recognize, it's able to tease apart the dignities from the disasters of each one of these value systems. And at once we've, we've sort of pared away, at least uh, temporarily, the, the you know, threatening pathologies of these worldviews, we could then be see how the positive values of each one can actually be integrated. You know, the example that I like love to point to in the United States is the, the success of gay marriage as an issue. Um, despite hyperpolarization, many other uh, political issues are stuck in their tracks. Uh, but gay marriage has moved forward, not just legally and politically, but also socially. It's gained widespread acceptance in the United States. And the part of their explanation for how this has occurred is that this issue of gay marriage, it integrates values from across the spectrum. It integrates progressive values, right? Because we obviously care about LGBTQ equality. It integrates the, the basic fairness values of modernity. And crucially, it integrates traditional values. Even though you know, many traditional religionists still object to gay marriage, politically, they've been disempowered because this, this basic right to make a family commitment Right? This, this, this sense of, of, of traditionalism embodied in the family values that say that everyone should have the right to make a family, that, that's a, a very important kind of integration. And so one of the things we're doing is um, using that example of gay marriage, this method of integrating values from across the spectrum to develop a, a platform of political issues with the idea that each one of these worldviews is actually a stakeholder in our democracy and that when we recognize how the, the values are actually interdependent, once the pathologies have been uh, at least bracketed, then that allows us to create what we're calling win-win-win political solutions, which gives a win to each one of the worldviews explicitly by trying to integrate their values into the issue. So, for example, we have a, a political um, issue position on uh, education, on climate change, on uh, immigration. Um, on healthcare and on education. And we're developing a large platform that'll demonstrate um, how this way of thinking, this, this integrative perspective can actually help, um, help us grow out of the culture war, which, uh, you know, which threatens our democracy at a deep level. So I can say a lot more, but that's a mouthful for now. Yeah, thank, thank you, Steve. And I, th I think Stephen and Jeff sometimes formulate this as we grew ourselves into the place that we're in and we're going to grow ourselves out of it. You know, how that actually happens and in what way and over what period of time is a big question mark. But just to, to kind of be able to rest in the confidence that we are in a process in which if you look at your own lives, and so what I'll do right now is maybe just shift your attention as a listening audience just to your own path and your own interests and see if you can locate some of these integral characteristics in yourself, you know, because to the extent that 
that we recognize each other and we can communicate with each other, we become a more powerful political body. And some of the work that I do is to train mediators and facilitators and really help them start to recognize and inhabit the, the integral view or this integral quality of consciousness that can give them more skill and more capacity in terms of working with people. So I would just ask you for a moment to get back to Jeff's original point. When I was at the at the Institute and I was, you know, leading seminars and we were training and working with people, you know, there were basically um, a number of different attributes that I, that we would work with people in noticing. So the first one is a capacity to genuinely do what Steve's describing, which is to literally see that the stability, the loyalty, the duty, the obedience of the traditional level of development, how important and and amazing that is, and what a, an accomplishment, what an achievement in human history that we built things as stable as our churches, you know, that we were able to create the foundation for government within a traditional kind of setting and how that stability, that predictability, and that sense of belonging is so important. And you can just for a moment, see if you can find that in yourself. Um, when we When we speak about modernism, you know, Steve talked about fairness and fairness has been critiqued by postmodernist view that it was it was fair in terms of law, but it wasn't fair in terms of how it actually delivered on the promise of fairness. So that's something that we can, I'll talk about in a minute. But fairness is born of, the, of an empiric perspective, you know, that we actually can bring something like objectivity to our experience, that we can measure things in terms of science, that we can, you know, compare this to that and see, you know, what weighs more and what weighs less. It's not based on opinion. It's based on measurements. It's based on in instrumentation. It's based on our ability to actually take a third person perspective and, and fairness and our court system arises out of that capacity. Now, anybody on this call that's been to court knows that there's a lot of subjectivity in it, but the attempt to be fair is a value that I'm sure you can find in yourself, the attempt to be objective or to be, you know, to use your rational capacities to arrive at a conclusion. I'm sure you can find that part in who you are. In terms of postmodernism, every level of development in some ways is a reaction to the previous development. You could say that what is not accomplished is, you know, it's sort of like the shadow side of let's say modernism, you know, with its objectivity and its coldness and its instrumentation, and its rationality and no feelings and, you know, the empiricism over relationship is precisely what postmodernism is attempting to correct, right? So you can find that part of you that says, but wait a minute, it hasn't really been fair. People of color, Black people in this country really don't have the, the amount of resources that white people do. We have to address that. How can we bring equity to the table? Not just the idea of equality, but the, the actuality of it, like there's something more to be done here. And what about the feeling state? And what about people's subjectivity? And what about psychology? And what about the tremendous amount of wounding that's gone on in the last 400 years? How do we become accountable to that? Where postmodernism is bringing, it's saying it's not, no, I'm going to set aside all of that objective empiric way of relating to the world? How do I really feel about what's happening here? How can I become a fuller human being? And if you can find all three of those perspectives in yourself, you have what we're talking about is a kind of integral consciousness, because it means that those value systems are alive and well. And as Jeff pointed out, it isn't one fighting with the other, it's actually learning how to allow them to coexist. But one of the things we did in our trainings that I want to share with you is that we taught people that to genuinely be able to hold multiple views in the mind, in the heart, to be able to speak to them, to imagine enacting them, it's like a yoga. It, 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 if you take a certain asana and you feel this stress in your lumbar region because you're just beginning it, the same is true in the mind. It's stressful. If you're not used to it, the stress will automatically, you'll collapse back into one view. It's difficult to genuinely inhabit and allow these views to function simultaneously. That's why it's a developmental achievement. That's why it moves beyond integral theory to integral consciousness, because it's literally been seen and observed in developmental studies across discipl discipline, self, um, ethics, different kinds of development, we're finding the same patterns emerging. So like Steve, I have a lot more to say about other qualities of integral consciousness. Um, 
but I'll stop there because I'm sure there are lots of questions that we could go on. I have a whole list of what we tried to help people really start to inhabit and activate in themselves so they could become more free and liberated in the world. So that's a good time out for me. Awesome. So yeah, some really good framing thoughts so far. And we've got three topics I think we're going to dig into over the next kind of half an hour or so. We're going to talk a little bit about the kind of intellectual dark web, the history of that, and kind of whether it was anti-progressive and how it relates to integral, what sort of integral perspective might be. I'm going to talk about the meaning crisis and then the response to the pandemic and how that has shown up. Because I think that's a really interesting topic that, yeah, I'm real, I've, I've got no idea what the response to that. I've got some idea what you might say to some of the other the other two questions, but the pandemic response, I think, has thrown up a lot of our political categories and has kind of upended a few expectations of how different kind of traditional or other kind of value systems might have responded to it. So I think it, I'd, I'd be really interested in, in hearing the integral lens on that. Um, but maybe let's start with the, the intellectual dark web, because that, that was something that we have covered on Rebel Wisdom since about 2018. And I also interviewed Ken about it in 2018. The sense then was, and we put out a film asking, was the intellectual dark web a nascent integral movement? And the sense was then that it had the potential to be. And I think there were naysayers who said, no, it's a regressive movement. And my perspective was, okay, I can see that it's drawing a line in the sand against kind of the excesses of green. And I think it did, but I also feel like it didn't push on. So maybe some of those original critiques that it was in some ways a reactionary movement were true to some degree. I think that initial kind of constellation of people probably were reactionary um, or reacting against something I think that needed to be reacted against in the culture, maybe drawing a line in the sand, but it never really pushed on. So I'm, I'm interested, Jeff, I think this is something that you've, you've paid a fair bit of attention to. Uh, yeah. So maybe let, let's start off with that as, as a topic and move on to the meaning crisis. Yeah, uh, every, every stage, as, as Steve said, uh, wants to push off of the previous stage. And so there's, for, there, there's really two streams that inform the intellectual dark web. One is the sort of the more the hard modernists, the materialists, and, and they're sort of allergic to green in general, even as an emerging stage. Now, all of us have, you know, in our modern contemporary world, if you will, you know, there's nobody who wants to enslave anybody else. Everybody wants gender equality. A lot of these ideas, you know, they make sense to people at modern stages of development. At postmodern, um, there's a deep sensitivity to the karmas of history that arise that a lot of people at the modern stage, just they're just not going to vibe with that. And they don't. And so they don't see this move to progressivism, this, this hypersensitivity to the sins and karmas of you know, history. They don't see that as progress. And of course, in many ways it isn't because every stage of development also has its totalitarians and its thought police and its cancellation policies. And you know, traditionalism is famous for them, you know, the Inquisition being one. <laughs> but also modernity has this uh, hard um, reducing of everything into material so that consciousness itself is just sort of this delusional byproduct of synaptic activity. And, um, and it's a di disenchantment of the world that, you know, is pointed out by people all the time. And, you know, as Ken Wilber said, we went from a world in traditionalism where God is everywhere to a world where God is nowhere. That's jarring for humanity to do that. And so that becomes its own kind of totalitarian atheism. So, and, and we see that in modern culture. Uh, in um, in postmodern green uh, progressive culture, you know, there's a certain growth these stages grow horizontally as well as vertically. And the, 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 the um, sensitivity um, and, um, you know, the, the 
religious aspects of social justice, environmentalism, and so forth takes on a, a quality of, um, you know, fanaticism. And, you know, fanatics have heretics. You know, you have to have a heretic to have a fanatic. And so all of these stages divide the world into pieces. And um, the intellectual dark web, I don't think ever got to the point where they saw progressivism as an unalloyed progress, that, that, there, that there was something really important to, uh, to this sensitivity that was coming online. And so they became sort of hardened against it. I'm not saying that's not evolutionary progress. I think it is. I think the intellectual dark web has done and continues to do great work in critiquing green, which needs to be critiqued. Uh, but I'm not sure they appreciate it in the way that um, Integral does. Who would like to pick up on that, Steve or Diane? Sure, sure I can add to that. Um, part of the, the way that, that we can understand the emergence of the intellectual dark web is as we see the, the larger cultural movement of these other stages. So progressive postmodernism, green, let's call it, right, for purposes of our discussion, that it's, you can see the beginnings of it in the enlightenment itself, right? This sort of revolt of modernity's artists and intellectuals as it's sometimes called, uh, are, are recognizing the unsustainability and the, and the lack of, of authentic transcendence within the emergence of modern culture and have been kind of rebelling against it. But it was really only in the 1960s when this worldview broke out of modernity and began to, to form its own uh, a cultural structure, its own worldview system that could be compared and contrasted with the previous worldviews of traditionalism and modernism. And as progressivism has matured from a youth movement in the 60s until now, uh, especially in the last few years since Trump was elected in the United States, that, that Trump's presidency itself, I would argue, is a reaction against the growing cultural power of progressivism. But Trump's presidency accelerated the emergence of progressivism, gave it even more power for both good and bad, right? There's, there's, there, this, this isn't just a, a singular ideology, right? I think it's a mistake to identify progressivism as coterminous with wokeism, right? Or some, some other specific ideology that is within it. Part of the cultural power of anti-racist ideology, for example, is that it's supported within this larger worldview that contains a variety of, of ideologies, including environmentalism and feminism and transgenderism. I mean, they're all, they're all within this larger cultural container. And this larger cultural container, as it gains cultural power, as the theory itself points to, it, it moves into a more stale thesis of itself, right? It emerges fresh, it gets a lot of things done, it improves the society in important ways. But then as it matures, its pathologies, its limitations and its shadow become more and more evident. And as this really came online in ways that the, the sort of totalitarian underpinnings of, of the negative elements of progressivism became more and more evident, we see Jordan Peterson, right? He, you know, he, he's one of the first people who's, who's not, at least at the time, identifiably on the right. You know, he seemed to be kind of center left. Uh, and, and, you know, as a professor at the University of Toronto and a Jungian, you know, he, he had this kind of refreshing refusal to accept what he saw as the tyranny of, of emerging progressive culture. And, and all of us could feel that he was able to channel it in a way that was very exciting. That, of course, led many others to identify with him and, and um, surf the momentum of that. But because it, it this, this, the, the critique of progressivism was primarily negative and didn't stake out what came next, it was perhaps inevitable that uh, the movement would lose steam and important figures like, uh, um, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson would be pulled by the gravity of the right, right? Now he's making all these videos for Prager University and, and he's become much more identifiably right than he was in 2018 when he first bur burst upon the scene. And I think we can say the same thing with um, a lot of the other proponents of the intellectual dark web. You can see a polarity within that itself. So, you know, there's lots more to say, but but that's at least some, some thinking on it. And maybe I can just kind of briefly, again, just call on my experience to support what Jeff and Steve are talking about. But, um, you know, one of my experiences in watching Jordan Peterson, because, because he is you know, he's a very perceptive person and his he's deeply committed to 
you know, his work and his research, but he, he really does lack a both and. I mean, there's just no question that when I listen to him, I, I experience the either or, and he seems not to be able to paste the truths of green and ask to go a step further, but it becomes a, you know, it becomes a, a duality of for and against. And that's the, so it doesn't surprise me in a way that he's been appropriated or he's drifted towards the right. I would say that. So a simple way to think about it that I could share would be um, the work that I've done in conversations about race. For example, maybe you've had the experience of uh, being in a conversation related to race where a, a lot of truths were spoken, but there also seemed to be um, maybe a point at which people were stuck or there might have been more hostility in the room or you weren't really able to build the kind of trust and allyship that you wanted to. And this was the case in a workshop that I did in Oakland. And um, it was it was a, by the invitation only and there were about 40 people there. The majority of people of color were black, the majority and the rest of the people were um, white. And at a certain point, the dynamic, this dynamic happened in which the, uh, the accusations and the, you could say the, the, the confrontation with history and with past abuse was super strong. And there was also an attempt on the pe part of the people in the room who were white to apologize, but it just wasn't going well. It wasn't leading to anything. And at a certain point, as my facilitator and I were both integrally trained, just basically said, okay, we're going to stop right now because whatever's happening, this is not where we want to end up. And I'm, I'm going to ask you both to go, we're going to actually go backwards and bifurcate rather than trying to be together. And I want you to find the place in yourself where you can gen genuinely come back into this conversation in a way that we can progress. And so my colleague who is Black led the other group and I led the group of white people. And I started by saying, tell us, let's right now identify every accusation and why it's true. What is it they're saying about us in this meeting, whether it's just you can't trust a, a white liberal or whatever it happens to be, what's true about it? And it was quite amazing to hear the white people say, I don't wanna share my power. I don't wanna give my children's power away. I don't know these people. I don't know how they're gonna work with power. I'm not sure they're gonna do any better job. I mean, just to listen to the owning of that reluctance to really want to invite you want to you know, distribute the power and the privilege, like to actually own that. Once we were able to do that, then the question became, what would it take for you to wanna to belong to this group of people? What would it take for you not to be in a cross-cultural group, but to want to belong to this group of white people in the room? Who would these people have to be? And then we posed that question and the group went around and found that they wanted people who were committed, who were honest, who were willing to be vulnerable, who weren't who weren't pushed around, who knew how to own their power, but also knew how to share it. And it was extremely enlivening and invigorating. And in the group with black folks, the same thing happened. And they actually owned how they, they kind of enjoy having, you know, the people who've been in this, these positions of power kind of fret and and wriggle and become uncomfortable. And they, they kind of own that shadow piece. And then they posed a very powerful question, which they shared later, which is if their ancestors were here today, what would they want from them as a people? How do they want them to show up? And it changed the entire discourse. By the end of the day, we still couldn't come back together. And, and I, I went home with my staff and just basically said, this is great guys, we just recreated segregation. How awesome is that? Right? <laughs> So it was kind of horrifying because I had no hope that we'd be able to talk to each other. When we came back the next day, it was unbelievable the conversations we were able to have and how we were able to move through that to the point that I felt such effervescence in the energy and such goodwill that I was moved to tears by the end of the second day. And so this ability to kind of be able to do what we're talking about, which is not get trapped by the polarity not get trapped by the either or, not get trapped by the right and wrong, affirm it and then say, okay, but what unfolds from it, it next? And that is the evolution of consciousness informing the evolution of culture. That's how it happens. So that's a very small concrete example of how it can work when we, when we step out of the polarity and refuse to be appropriated by it. 
it's difficult to do because it's really deep in our history to, to belong to our group and to fight for our principles and to find solidarity there. To, to give that up and to find solidarity with a bigger view and an unknown future is a, is a much harder task. So I would just like to add that. Awesome. Right on. So I'm gonna uh, suggest that we move on to the response to the pandemic and then end on the meaning crisis because that's a little bit more kind of big picture. And the response to the pandemic is, is really fascinating. I'm really interested to see how you view the different kind of value systems showing up. So I'm in the final process of putting together a piece that hopefully will be released tomorrow called The Religious Wars of the Pandemic Endgame. And it's two hours long. It's got several interviews with John Bavaki, with Mary Harrington, uh, Jonathan Pajot, and a few other people. And it's really looking at the incredible levels of intensity around the pandemic response and how that's sort of been dragged into both the culture war and also underneath that, this sense of religiosity that seems to be showing up on all sides. And I've got an interview with Mary Harrington, for example, where she, she wrote a piece for Unheard talking about the purity codes, which is called Vaccine Purity has, in, in, has Infected the West. And it was about how there was a sort of Girardian scapegoating of the unvaccinated, um, this sense of also, she said that there was a kind of authoritarianism that was coming through that was unexpected to come from liberals, effectively, that it revealed an awful, a, a lot of, um, yeah, authoritarianism hidden within liberalism that was kind of latent that seems to have come out. She also talked a lot about the Jonathan Haidt's um, framework, the moral taste buds, and I've heard I don't know if it was you, Jeff, before saying that Jonathan Haidt is a very integral thinker. He kind of looks at how people are, are um, his book, the famous book is The Righteous Mind, how good people are divided by politics and religion. And he talks about the moral taste buds. And Mary also pointed out that the taste buds we've always associated with conservatives in Haidt's framework, which includes sanctity and degradation, degradation are now showing up on the liberal side, especially with the vaccine issue, but also with a lot of the other lockdown uh, and, and kind of pandemic response measures. So, yeah, I mean, just from the very big picture, I'd love to hear how you feel that the yeah, integral and spiral dynamics can shed light on the new, the vaccine wars, which have kind of subsumed just about everything else. <laughs> I, I take a stab at it. Uh, yeah, I think what the idea of cultural development can bring to this discussion is uh, it's like these, these taste buds. Traditionalists are at, um, the, the, these are the people who are just, you know, the Trumpsters. To the degree that they're traditionalists, they are, that's the stage of development that out of which this idea that sovereignty rises in my breast that I am not subject to the king, I'm not subject to anybody. And so there's this antipathy to government power that's just natural at that stage of development. They, the, the, the hoofbeats of the king's men coming after your sons and daughters still rings loudly at that stage of development. And so that's just a natural antipathy. And I grew up with these people, they hate the government. So then there's the modernists, um, and, uh, you know, the modernist, it, thank God for the modernist, because it's the first stage of development where winner doesn't take all, you know, where we actually create structures where we can fight it out. And so we do. And, and then there's the, the, uh, the stage of development that uh, as we move into green, green sort of, again, has this antipathy to modernism. They don't like this individual, um, certainly don't like uh, capitalism. And so for them, there's a natural affinity to government power. They, of course, are, they populate the government, you know, and NGO, and that's, that those folks tend to be postmodern. And they have, they, they like government power. Their natural fear is to corporate power because they see what corporate power has done to despoil the world. That's the piece of the truth that they have. 
And so every stage, of course, has their religious uh, qual uh, quality and again, their fanatics. Uh, but you have people, and I, 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 I hate to say it, but I have friends. I live here in Boulder, Colorado, which is a liberal bastion. And I have friends, they delight in the lockdowns. They like it. They like dampening this um, rampant commercialism and capitalism. And there's, it's just natural to that stage of thinking. And I think that goes some distance to explaining why these, you know, the, the, these magnetic polarities pull these two sides uh, to these two different types of policies. I could um, add to that a little bit and say that, um, thank you, Jeff, uh, and say that another pattern that's even in some ways more abstract than what Jeff just described is the, the, the way these cultural, these worldview systems are forming a kind of structure of evolutionary emergence in human history. We can see that the pattern of their emergence and pushing off against each other, as we've as we've described, is a dialectical pattern, right? It's it, it, we could argue that this dialectical pattern characterizes or colors evolution at every level of its development. And so, in this cultural ecosystem that we're talking about, we can see that traditionalism, really for thousands of years, of various forms of religious civilizations, that their 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 overall characterization as a cultural structure was communitarian. Right? The idea was to sacrifice self-interest for the, the greater, greater interests of the group. And one of the ways that, that modernity and the Enlightenment breaks out of what it sees as that stifling conform, conformity, you know, that, that communitarian demands that, that religion dictates everything. It, you know, it colors art, it colors science, everything has to conform to religion. It breaks out of that with a, with a, a trope or a dialectical move toward individualism. Right. And it reclaims that not just, you know, in an abstract way, but in a very concrete way with the emergence of liberal values. Right. As described by Locke and as, as implemented in the American founding documents and many other places in the world. This this idea that the individual has has sovereign rights from the, a sphere of protection from this collective. That's a major innovation in history. I sometimes call it the, the Cambrian explosion of cultural evolution. But beyond modernity, modernity is not sustainable entirely because even though it's relying on traditionalism to supply much of its civilizing influence, as traditionalism wanes in history, it becomes less and less legitimate and powerful. This has signaled the way for the emergence of this next step of the dialectic, which is a return to a, a communitarian orientation. It's more about we than the individual. And so even though I wouldn't characterize the emergence of progressivism as a return to religion, as some like Haidt have, um, I would say that that it's 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 authentically new in lots of ways. But in this larger trajectory of, of dialectical progression from communitarian to individual, and then back to communitarian, progressivism is attempting to kind of reclaim a sense of transcendence that they see modernity is lacking. They can't go back to the old transcendence supplied by religion. So they're, they're looking for a new kind of transcendence in all kinds of different ways. Each one of the ideologies within progressivism is trying to kind of find a type of religious transcendence, whether it be in environmentalism or in an identity or in you know, the, the problems of racism. And so this is, you know, it's positive in many ways and negative in some ways too. And so one of the ways this impacts the pandemic and the vaccine uh, situation is that progressivism and its now large control over major the, the you know the administrative state and many um, many of the institutions in the United States is this attempt to form a new we has 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 got to try to do things that were once done by the religious civilization that preceded it, and so creating a membrane of belonging, uh, some kind of sacral border that says these are the sanctified and these are the, you know, the heathens, as Jeff mentioned, that's a very important task, which this progressive culture finds itself doing even sometimes unconsciously, but it leads to um, forms of, you know, potential tyranny with respect to uh, vaccines. Just, just to add, um, I found that I found the pandemic to actually challenge my integral sensibilities because when it comes to managing public health and it comes to the way in which we, we've relied on science and the long history of vaccinations, I just found myself kind of, I came out of the whole thing more of kind of an empiricist, you know, but within 
our Zen practice, and we usually, you know, we come together for retreats, 40, 50, sometimes 60 people come together for retreats. So it's this traditional context in which a number of people, most people, the vast majority of people were vaccinated, but there w- there w- was a, a, a group of people who were non-vaccinated or anti-vaccinated who were progressive in terms of uh, doubting the science, doubting the rigor of the studies, believing the vaccines were brought too quickly into being and there was a lack of safety in that. And those, to me, the, those more progressive people in, in our group were mistrustful of the care the government had taken. And then there was another group who were more using um, Chinese herbs and maybe ivermectin and maybe ivermectin kind of went back and forth, but it was maybe more a new age camp, you know, that that didn't, that had always not trusted modern medicine and had always moved towards Chinese or alternative medicine. And they were the group of students that were not vaccinated. And so we were faced with this big question, you know, it, it came down to, you know, public policy came down to this immediate question of what do we do? How do we practice? And so basically we just had to reframe it around, you know, what is the, what is the best way that we can allow vac- both vaccinated and unvaccinated people to come and ensure the safety of everyone? And so everybody, everybody has a piece of the truth. There's something true in all these perspectives, but I felt really challenged by it, David. But the only thing that we could do was to let these perspectives coexist until we came up with a protocol. And we actually managed to hold our first in-person retreat in two years last summer. And we did it without drama and we did it without a lot of, um, what to say, uh, you know, animosity towards one another, because they were really, it was really, you know, people feel strongly about this. So that's a little bit more of an applied experience of the challenge, but I find it hard in some ways to accept the exclusive truths, where if I can create an environment in which the multiple truths are all related to as true and partial, some are more true, some are less true, but that there's a place for them all, then I think we can get to, but Again, you know, it's a difficult thing. Not everybody is an integral leader, you know, so that's my response. Mm. Yeah, I found something similar in making this piece Mm -hmm. is that it's very difficult to hold this kind of meta perspective when there are real world kind of health implications of all the things that you're saying and all the things you're putting out. It's kind of like it's pulling you to one side or the other and you and you can't kind of negate the, the factual level, no matter how much you try to kind of hold that piece, which I think is why it's been so divisive. Yeah. Um, so. And yet we've done it from another point of view. It's it's the the cost has been great. And yet we've we've done it. You know, we've actually allowed all these multiple truths to coexist. And, and it's also been. The problem, we haven't had a really powerful communitarian response that there's been a lot of individualism and a lot of divisiveness, but that's exactly what we've been living is multiple truths. You know what I'm saying? Like we actually yeah. have been living all these different value sets the yeah. whole time because yeah. we haven't had one cohesive approach like Australia or New Zealand. So we've mm. been in the in the kind of rough and tumble of multiple truths in a way. Well, and, and let me just say that one of the things I love about thinking integrally, if you will, is that, you know, you sort of factor in that there's no good option. You know, evolution is about fighting our way forward, failing our way forward, floundering our way forward, um, you know, friending our way forward. But we're not supposed to be getting it right. And there's something about that that I find um, empowering, relaxing, and, um, you know, in sh- again, t- to get into the, maybe the meaning crisis a, l- a little bit, but enchanted, you know, there's something about that that's alive. Good, good segue, Jeff, into the meaning crisis. <laughs> um, so let's wrap up the meaning crisis in 10 minutes, and then we can go on to the, the Q&A section. Well, I guess I'll start again. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's, pretty simple. I mean, when you, and th- it, strangely enough, th- this, uh, th- this new myth, capital M myth of evolution, individual consciousness evolution and cultural evolution is brought to us by science, 
you know, the atheist stage of development, which tells us that 13.8 billion years ago, something blew out of nothing and has relentlessly complexified over the last 13.8 billion years to create us and this Zoom call and everything. And, you know, I'm sorry, but there's a religion in there somewhere. And, um, and I, the, the feel, it's, it's like Walt Whitman, you know, I, I can feel that procreate urge arising in me. And part of integral practice is getting in touch with that and seeing this endless, this, that every moment has a possibility for something new to emerge, a, a new moment of creativity, that my life matters, that I'm here to, in some ways, perfect the universe because that's what's going on. You know, the universe is awakening and I'm part of that and I can participate in that. And again, I, I, you know, all of human history until we got to modernity saw that there was another world beyond our perceptions. Yes, two worlds. And that the, 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 the world beyond our perception is the world of meaning and the world of infinite and eternal in the sense that it's beyond time and space. And that's all very mysterious, but that can be practiced with and realized, capital R realized, um, you know, in any moment. And that's a re-enchantment of the world that is, uh, you know, a necessary corrective to what modernity did, you know, God bless modernity, I'll feel pardon the expression, but it disenchanted the world and, uh, and, and post-modernity tries to re-enchant it. It's like you were talking about, Steve. In some ways, it brings back the subtle realm, and we try different things. We kiss lots of frogs, and we become anti-materialistic and consumer and so forth. But at Integral, we get to you know, download this. It's like E.O. Wilson said, the greatest myth in history, and, and myth in a good sense. And that is this amazing creation that we're part of. Hallelujah. I have meaning. <laughs> Diane, go ahead. You're muted, Diane. Sorry about that. I'm just responding to the chat because I'm noticing that Ken is saying that Australia is not more cohesive. It's just more tyr tyrannical and suppressive. Um, but I think that, you know, the reason we that tyranny becomes appealing to people is when the fragmentation, the confusion and the differences become so threatening that tyranny is preferable because it creates a certain kind of coherence and predictability and stability that without, you know, it's existentially upsetting, you know, to have to to be in the place where, where we all are. Um, I guess I guess I would say that uh, the comment that Jeff made earlier about how modernism has a way of even the word consciousness, the word spirit, you know, it goes, it goes tremendously out of fashion because it's when it looks backward at particularly the religious traditions, they themselves became monolithic and oppressive. So spirit was appropriated and, and um, formalized and the, the priesthood dominated everyone. And there was a lot of abuse. So spirit is mixed up in tradition. So modernism kind of clears the decks of spirit and spirit consciousness, um, even the human heart in some ways is kind of given the title of, of woo woo, you might say. And yet it's a very short period of time where people don't want that quality of meaning. Um, and meaning, meaning seems to be, I, I also don't experience the crisis of meaning. I experience the crisis of coherence, which is different than a crisis in meaning. And um, that the meaningfulness, you know, for the modern period is reformulated into material success and, and all of that. But very, very quickly with postmodernism, you find people again, reaching out for spiritual practice, reaching into the traditions in a new way, forming their own ritual lives. It's like a very brief period before that desire to participate with um, the, the inherent meaningfulness of being a human being comes back online. 
So for me, as I, as I already said, I don't experience that meaning crisis. To me, that's a, that's a, a characteristic of modernism. And sometimes I think in our thinking, we, we kind of confuse those things. So Steve, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. Well, let me just agree with what you just said first, um, and and also say that this this hunger for transcendence of some kind, transcendence being understood as a kind of an umbrella term, which might name all the ways that people are moved to serve something greater than themselves or, or identify with something greater than themselves. So this this hunger, this deep hunger for transcendence, you know, for for most of human history, it was satisfied by some version of religion. Right. Modernity comes along and, and, you know, every one of these stages in this dialectical process, the, the God of one becomes the devil of the next. Right. So within you know, secular modernity, trying to do everything to push off against and, and negate uh, the, the political and social claims of religion was, I'd say, in some ways, a healthy exercise. But of course, then you end up where, where this sort of secular view, this scientific view, can't supply the transcendence that our hearts long for, and that isn't something that we can just get over. So we see with progressivism um, that kind of attempt, you know, through the decades ago, the emergence of, of New Age spirituality. New Age is now a um, term of derision. Um, but many of us who are in this uh, larger integral movement have come to it through various forms of progressive spirituality. But we've transcended the new age, at least we like to think so, in the ways that we're recognizing that, that uh, transcendence can be found in many ways, that each one of the world's great lineages of spiritual devotion, spiritual teachings and practice and spiritual experience, that these can be understood as like lines of development that continue to mature up through these stages. And they're not just, although many of them start at the traditional stage, Many of them have realizers uh, who teachers within their lineages who far transcended uh, traditionalism as a as a value frame. And as Jeff mentioned, the idea that that evolution itself, the narrative story of evolution that we that has only been revealed to humanity in the last several decades, that this is a kind of spiritual teaching. That there's no mistaking that something more keeps coming from something less. That, that we, you know, whatever, whether we can say the universe has a purpose or not, there's certainly purpose in the universe because we all have it. And we're all striving for some, we're drawn by almost like a gravity or magnetism of transcendence. And we can put labels on this. We can talk about it in terms of the beautiful, the true, and the good. You know, how the, for we, can, we can take the science of evolution. We can see how it points to an inclusive philosophy that can accommodate a, 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 a spiritual view but at the same time, critique every spiritual view. So um, for us, you know, if, if, if we've we've we sort of would like to claim that we've transcended the meaning crisis, although we recognize that it's a crisis in the larger society because these views of evolutionary spirituality haven't really been you know widely uh, uh, populated or or understood. But we do feel that that this sort of reconciliation with this authentic notion of transcendence is one of the um, one of the great benefits of this evolutionary view that we're we're advocating, and um, you know, obviously, we could talk about that, you know, for an hour. But but evolutionary spirituality definitely solves a meaning crisis, as I think uh, Diane and Jeff would agree. Let's tell John Bavaki the good news. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I I, don't yeah, think you know, I mean, <laughs> if you're if you're if you're convinced that you know religion is wrong and that nothing can replace it. And that it's all nonsense, then yeah, you're left with a conundrum of, of what you might characterize as a crisis. But you know, I'm not going to critique Verbeke. I certainly uh, applaud much of his work. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and I and I would also say that um, I would make just a little bit of a distinction that in within the Zen tradition, and you, the rest of you, can tell me how you feel about this. But within the Zen tradition, the realization, if you will, of that which is timeless which is unknowable, ungraspable, and yet eminent and can be realized and enacted because it's not subject to time, it is necessarily not evolutionary. Right. You know, so the thing we're realizing is not evolving, but the ways we're realizing it, the ways we're engaging you know, a thousand year old tradition in a way in a postmodern culture and we're, you know, softening the hierarchy and we're doing sutra study in ways in which we're exchanging our respective insights. 
the 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 practices and the the interpretive frames evolve, but the the thing itself, the transcendent itself, is beyond time. So I think that's just an important, for me at least, an important distinction, because evolution is time. Right. So we're going to move on to some of the questions. Please do check out the, the Q&A form, I'm just putting it into the chat again. If you want to go there and add your initials to any question you particularly like, we will come to those. Um, I'm going to, I'm not sure who's put this one in because they've just put David, please read. Um, <laughs> so I will, I will read this one. You, I don't know if everyone here is aware, um, Nora Bateson recently said that uh, got quite a lot of traction for saying that stage theory was colonial and bought BS and must be gotten rid of. Um, interested in your thoughts about that, because uh, it did it did pick up quite a bit of it, it got quite a lot of traction at the time. So it's, it seems to be sort of a widespread perspective. Um, yeah, I could take, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a way, of course, uh, in which stage development theory, it, it, we're talking, you know, Piaget and all of the developmentalists and certainly the cultural developmentalists, that there is a simplification of a very complex reality. And, you know, there's, there, there, it needs to be a reaction against that. And this is part of that. And also there is a naive hierarchical thinking that took place in traditionalism and into modernity where there was, you know, was seen as a, a cultural evolution was seen as social Darwinism. And of course it was used to um, oppress people and to uh, you know, provide a pretext for colonization and racism and everything else. So that needs to be purified from the, um, you know, from, from, from what we're doing. And so uh, th this is the project of post-modernity. And I would say that a, a critique that says that developmental theory is BS is a deeply green postmodern critique in that it is just completely deconstructive. You know, it's, it needs to be thrown out, it's BS, and there's nothing to be said about it that's positive. And fair enough, you know, that's what uh, Green needs to deconstruct these triumphalist narratives of history, and they do, and that's part of this uh, controversy. Uh, what happens beyond that, that's not the end, deconstruction is not the end, is a reconstruction that appreciates natural hierarchy, that um, acorns grow into saplings and seedlings and oaks that there's a natural movement from three-year-olds to 10-year-olds to, you know, and a 10-year-old is not a defective 12-year-old, and that there is just a growth that's a natural growth that is built into the cosmos that um, can be mapped. It can be uh, in, in a way that is not oppressive, that is actually liberating and friendly to all, and that sees that, like, for instance, uh, indigenous wisdom uh, magic, if you will, is sorely missing that needs to be reintegrated and that the gifts of these previous stages uh, need to be brought into an integral uh, world or an integral age, an integral view. And then the other thing that, um, you know, and you see this in the dawn of time or the, the dawn of everything, the Graeber book, Wegner book, um, also very deconstructive about stage theory that there is something that is, um, you know, it's like if you look at this, the, the stages as this ever increasing, like a, an archery target, you know, where new stages are added, you can occasionally put one of those immersive blenders in there and just sort of whip it up. That all through history, people have spiked into all sorts of levels and various lines and saints and sages, these are, these are the saints and sages. These are the people who have seen ahead. You know, modernity makes a stab in Greece, but the center of gravity of the world isn't quite ready for it. But yet it still becomes, you know, part of the strata that is then remined 
in the Enlightenment. And that this any kind of lockstep um, uh, explanation of history needs to be um, uh, uh, countered and, you know, but not completely uh, deconstructed, but not dissolved. How's that? <laughs> I have a super quick comment based on deconstructed but not dissolved. When I hear that, I hear some conflations because I think the the um, imperative of green to destabilize power structures because of the abuse of power structures is really important. So there are two parts to it. One is not creating hierarchy because hierarchy is prone to abuse. And but but maybe even more subtly is that you know, all human beings are equal within the eyes of God, right? All human beings are inherently by their nature equal. And yet as a, as a spiritual teacher, there's a very big difference be someone who walks into the Zendo day one, who's been sitting for a few years intermittently, who sat really solidly realized emptiness or non-duality and who has literally relinquished any attachment to all of it, you know, as the, in other words, we experience stage evolution, you know, the, the acorn to the oak, but in every endeavor we do, there's stage evolution, you know? So why wouldn't there be an evolution in our perspectives? There's probably been an evolution in your perspectives over your life, you know, they've, they've changed, they've expanded, they've refined. So when I hear that, I just feel like there are th some things being kind of mixed up in that assertion. And it's, it, I also hear it as like, well, yeah, I understand, I understand what the, what the uh, perception is, but I think it's not ar articulated very clearly and very um, with relationship to how much stage development we all experience, whether it's in cooking or whatever it happens to be in. So, yeah. How about you, Steve? You want to say? Yeah, something? thanks. I could chime in and say that um, because what we're uh, talking about is a philosophy of evolution, which is itself evolving. Critiques and attacks are actually um, welcome and and make us stronger. I think that that at a surface level we can appreciate Nora's uh, uh, attack because there's something about this post progressive worldview which is subversive to many of the deeply held values of progressivism. That dialectic is causing some tension, as it should. And I think that that one of the immaturities of uh, the spiral dynamics and, and integral theory as it was developing in the last decade was that it, it was em the, the emphasis was on um, psychological development. And I personally think there was too much weight put on people, individual persons being at a given level. And, and I'm, I'm in my work, I'm trying to, to sort of liberate our understanding of that so that we're not, we're not thinking of it as psychological terms primarily, but rather thinking of it as in cultural terms in the sense that, look, modernity is a world historical fact. Right, something happened in the Enlightenment that, at least in developed countries that have adopted the modernist culture, it's changed the world forever. I mean, in, in, in it's it's in some ways the biggest change in human history, bigger than the original domestication of agriculture ten thousand years ago. So modernity is something. It, it, it's a cultural emergence of, of you know world historical significance. What is that? How can we characterize it? Is it simply the Industrial Revolution? Is it simply science? No, according to our analysis, it is a, a worldview. And these worldviews are, are, even though social science can't get its arms around them, I mean, they can begin to grope their way toward it. But because we're talking about values, we ultimately need political philosophy, social philosophy, to understand these larger structures of history and how they're impacting the present and the moment. So if we allow that, okay, there's these religious civilizations that dominate world history for thousands of years. And then in the enlightenment, this new thing emerges. Lots of people have talked about what this is and how it works. But I think the, the growing conclusion is that understanding that it's a set of values, that it's a perspective, that it's a kind of consciousness and, and indeed a, 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 a worldview, that helps us understand it. And so the natural behavior of systems, you know, as Jeff mentioned, is to grow by stages, right? This isn't some foreign conception. It's, I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine that we could achieve growth without it. Now, if you if you want to deny growth and flatten all hierarchies, then maybe you can throw the 
you know, the baby out with the bathwater. But ultimately, modernity is best understood as a worldview in terms of the, why it makes the improvements and brings the new pathologies that where it, it gains traction and why without the consciousness that enacts, you know, a modernist economy and, and a, you know, rule of law and liberal values, without that kind of consciousness, other countries in the world are struggling to adopt and get the benefits of modernity. And then that, once we understand that the two-stage system, which is you know, not always called a worldview, but well agreed upon in the larger you know, academic literature, this idea of, of traditionalism and modernity is, is well established. So then when we begin to understand progressive postmodernism as a third major worldview uh, that's come online and gained cultural power over the last 60 years, we can begin to see these worldview, this, this ecosystem of worldview emergence explains our culture more satisfactorily than any other less partial, uh, I mean, more partial view. So we, we have to understand growth in some way. We have to be able to make these differentiations if we're going to uh, uh, do what is called upon uh, of us of history right now, which is to reintegrate, to create some larger emergence that can synthesize uh, all of the uh, all of the different um, worldviews and and the uh, the cacophony of the culture war, which uh, you know threatens to um, to presage a regression. So we're, we're, we're you know we're trying to grow out of it. We want to grow. Steps and stages are a necessary understanding that goes with this understanding of growth. And this next step beyond progressive postmodernism, I think, is best understood as a worldview. Mm. Awesome. So wonderful comment from Carla in the chat that I'll direct everyone towards. And we'll go a little bit past the 90 minutes just so that we are able to have uh, a, a couple more questions. Uh, next up is Darren, Darren Shetler. Hi. Uh, so my question, um, Coleman Hughes and John McWhorter have been pointing out research showing uh, police killings in the U.S. may not necessarily be racially biased, with misperceptions being driven by disproportionate legacy and social media coverage. To what extent are these, are the dysfunctions we're currently seeing in postmodern progressivism being driven by this particular issue? What what's a healthy integral response to these misperceptions? Steve, you want to go for it or die? I'm happy to, and I was just speaking, so maybe uh, one of you two can go next. No, I think it's a really important question, and I'd love to hear what you have to say. I do think about it a lot, so I'd love to hear what you have to say on it, either one of you. Sure, well, I can, I'll, I mean, this is something that we're, we've are we been grappling with and paying a lot of attention to at the Institute for Cultural Evolution over the past two years, because uh, we are um, deeply committed to racial equality as a value. We're sympathetic to the fact that that a, a big part of America's you know historical pathology that we haven't worked out yet is the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and how that still affects uh, you know material circumstances here in the 21st century. Um, at the same time, I think uh, it, it's fair to say that we can also see the the rise of uh, as I mentioned anti-racist ideology. Uh, in you know critical race theory, wokeism, there's many different labels that are vying to describe what I'm talking about. None of them are ideal, but that in its attempt to um, to tap in to a current of transcendence that could liberate people, that could that could give larger meaning to what it means to be a progressive person, that they struck a gusher right in 2020 uh, in, the, in the sense that there was this huge outcry over the murder of George, George Floyd and that this, um, the, the power of the, of the, the sort of the righteous uh, um, uh, zealousness by which this movement was pursued. Of course, the rest of uh, American society, at least, you know, smart America, the, the more, um, uh, the sort of the non-Trumpian establishment were sort of bowled over by it, right? They couldn't resist it for reasons that we perhaps might be sympathetic to. But now um, as time has gone by and, and the, I wouldn't call it a moral panic, but the moral excitement of this movement has we've gained some perspective on it. We're beginning to see that, that there are elements of it that are um, dogmatic and and uh, totalitarian, you know, tyrannical. That there's an end game of of uh, 
of the extremity of, of a critical theory that, um, you know, each one of these polarities that we see continually reemerging, as they have, if you take them to their extremes, they become pathological, right? So if you take liberty and equality, for example, as a, as a, a basic polarity, liberty by itself, you're going to have gross inequality. But if you try to force perfect equality, you're going to wipe out liberty. Ideally, you need both to moderate and support each other. And so when we're dealing with the zealotry of wokeism, it's very important to see how, um, how the, the, the pathology of that is something that's a challenge. We can take it in our stride that I, I don't think there, there is a chance that it's going to completely take over all of our institutions. <laughs> Although certainly, you know, it's threatening enough. It certainly animated a lot of political will on the right side of the spectrum here in the United States. Um, I ultimately have confidence that, um, that, you know, we've had many uh, sort of enthusiastic awakenings in American history, right? The first great awakening in the 1740s, the second great awakening in the 1840s, that, that this can be compared to that in the sense that it's kind of a religious revival and, and it's had um, a, a far reaching effect. And, and the good parts of it has made American society more sensitive to the sins of racism and more aware of the fact that this is in a, if we're gonna make a better society, we're gonna have to overcome this inequality, at least partially. And at the same time, it's also made us realize that if we left that unchecked, that the trajectory of that burns it all down, right? You know, they wanna dismantle, not just the bad parts, but the good parts, the best of what's come before, and that's strengthened this other side of the polarity that says, no, not so fast. We're not going to wipe out uh, modernity. We're not going to wipe out traditionalism. And uh, progressivism as a, a worldview is not qualified to govern, at least not at this point in history. So I think it, I see it as um, a evolutionarily potent disruption of the status quo, which is making room. It's making people realize that, that the left or the right as they currently exist are both unsatisfactory. And that points the way toward the opportunity for this next level of emergence, which is what we stand for. Steve, will you just say something quick about misinformation and social media as part of your Sure. Analysis? Well, of course, there's many, thanks. There's many elements of the many contributing factors to the hyperpolarization that's disrupting American democracy. And I think, you know, the UK as well. Um, certainly, you know, technological changes, social media, oligarchy, um, uh, uh, the campaign finance laws. There are many structural features that have been pointed out by mainstream commentators who are trying to get their arms around uh, political polarization. But from our perspective, um, it's, it's resulting from growth, from this disruptive growth that I talked about at the beginning, that the progressivism is, is kind of the, 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 the old liberal consensus which allowed American democracy to be relatively functional after World War II until about the 1970s, but that's been disrupted for good and bad. We, we know we're now in this situation where um, these cultural changes are uh, either threatening a, a regression or a disintegration of our social solidarity, or they're presaging the way for further growth that can, and there'll always be some version of left and right. We're not suggesting that we're gonna have some kind of kumbia baya coming together with perfection, but, um, I think that the, the, the spirit of evolution itself, right, which has guided uh, the emergence of democracy over the last 200 years, that that's not going to be quashed by, you know, radical wokists. I mean, that, that, that's going to regain its momentum and move beyond uh, the disruption toward something that can uh, reestablish at least a temporary truce between these cultural factions that can allow for effective governance, um, or at least you know, partially effective governance. Yeah, and let me add something too, in that it's sort of a two cheers for social media in a way. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, this is the evolution of communication. And um, <clears throat> one of the things we're seeing is that um, it's kind of a mass therapy in a way, in that everybody gets to be seen and counter each other. And I think of, you know, actual therapy and therapy that's done couples therapy. You know, the classic uh, approach of couples therapy is for the therapist to have the two warring sides facing each other. And each one has to describe the perspective of the other to the other's satisfaction. And that's what we wanna do here. 
I mean, black people, people who have been oppressed, people who, are, you know, the, the whole uh, catastrophe. Everybody wants to be seen and everybody wants to be understood. And I, 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 I think of something that Chilgum Trumpa said, he was a Tibetan master who brought uh, Naropa, brought Buddhism to the West. And he said that when you really see another person and really see their karma and really see who they are deep in their eyes, then there's only one appropriate response. And that is, oh, and it's just, you know, being human is hard. And so we, you know, social media allows us to, it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's wild and woolly, but um, there's a lot of, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of fruit to these, uh, you know, what's going on there and the mass therapy, in my opinion. Diane, did you want to say something more or? No, I don't really have, I don't have anything to add. I, I agree. I think we're in the very front. I mean, technology is a whole other huge conversation about what its role is and how it will evolve and how we need to learn to work with it and what, what restraints need to be put on our discourse. And, you know, is there a law, you know, on the internet? I don't, I think we're living in, in the wild west of technology right now, and it is having a, a very, you know, unmanageable impact on our life and our experience, but we just have to hunker down. And, and part of what happened, well, the reason I love to talk to Steve and Jeff is that they give me confidence that there, there's a way through because I can become kind of overwhelmed and despondent in relationship to all the differences and the many different worldviews and different ways of seeing things and our inability to agree. And then when I spend time with them, I just, you know, I kind of settle into the heart and develop my spiritual confidence and and trust that we'll find our way through and that's really <laughs> so i'm going to kind of impose an arbitrary restriction and ask all the questions that have more than one set of initials and that means that the last question and it feels like a right the right one to end on clay yours has three votes yeah i think i know which one this is um uh, I would love to hang out with you guys, by the way. Uh, this has been very <laughs> stimulating. Um, so could each of you paint a little picture, like a sketch of what the higher ground looks like? So as we wind our way toward turquoise or whatever the color is beyond that, um, what do you see would be nice to arrive at? Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab first here. Um, <clears throat> I was... Um, listening to a talk that Ken Wilber did not long ago, where he was talking about the integral age and integral consciousness. And he said something that struck me. And he said that uh, w when people uh, hit the integral stage of consciousness, they realize that they're about 12 times smarter than they thought they were. Because they're literally able to, you know, occupy these various addresses in the, you know, sort of realm of humanity. And that the default is, and I think that we're, we're seeing this now and we're seeing this in young people. And I think, you know, our grandchildren will be rolling their eyes at our culture war. But uh, it's, it's the default position of when you run into another point of view, you become curious instead of critical. Simple as that. And when, and I think there's just a natural, people are tired of being critical. I mean, some, I'm talking, you know, get this leading edge of the arrow, uh, but the um, coming, the sacred world to come uh, will all be, you know, we'll all have it all. You know, we can be gender fluid, no problem. We can, you know, we can be faithful. You know, we can be organized. We can be rational. We can be sensitive. Um, human capacity, if you look at the history of human capacity and the development, I mean, every stage is a radical new thing. And I think integral will be as well. Yeah, so I, I would add to that, that the, the reduction in fear and the increase in curiosity 
and the ability to to see other predic other people's predicaments as your own. And I think flexibility and identity were already starting. We glimpsed a lot, you know, as people move from kind of ethnocentric, nationalistic, and tribal identities into global citizens and even non-binary identity. And you know, the the as we start to loosen up identity, that allows for a lot more um, growth and change. And then our, our, you know, one of the things the research shows us is that people stop telling kind of either idealized versions of themselves or denigrated versions, and they start telling growth narratives. You know, what are the things that I've learned? So learning becomes really a really, really important value. And then finally, I think that, um, you know, we talked about the crisis of meaning and meaning and purpose, you know, the, the satisfaction of your interior life and the enactment of your exterior goals and what it is you want to accomplish and be in the world, we're not forced to choose between meaning and purpose. They become much more coherently one. And then our activity becomes compassionate. There's a, a much, the, you know, the, the human heart is infinite in what it can experience. The, the heart of a human being is very conditioned that the the of an individual but the the uh, collective human heart is vast and i think that's one of the things that as we evolve we'll start to see in a different way thank you um diane and jeff let me add to those excellent responses um our theory of change can be highly simplified by saying that consciousness evolves when people expand the scope of what they can value and we can see this in the stages themselves, right? With modernity, there's a bigger grasp on truth. With you know, post-modernity progressivism, there's a sort of including those who've been left behind. And with this next step, this post-progressive step, we're able to bring online um, in, in, in ways that, that haven't been achieved in history before, I would argue, um, th this entire um, uh, spectrum of human values um, and, you know, not just traditional modern and progressive, but also, you know, indigenous wisdom and, and, you know, wisdom from warrior societies. In other words, as humanity has dealt with its challenging life conditions throughout its ascent, uh, it, it has developed um, deep seated values that we continue to need and, and bringing those on this kind of expansion of our ability to, to, um, to value, to recognize the beautiful, the true and the good in, in all these different cultures that feels, it, it, there's, there's a certain relief that goes with that, a certain sort of um, uh, uh, a sense of, of well-being um, that because there, there's a, with, with this increase in the metabolism of values, there's a reduction of fear, right? So another way of talking about this, um, this dialectical transcendence that we're advocating is, uh, is, is the idea of transcend and include, right? It's another way of talking about the, the emergence of the dialectic. And so we get to both in, in, include and transcend. We include, like I said, all these other values, but it's not just a matter of abstractly assenting to some of the positive values of these other worldviews. It's a way in which we get to know more deeply than ever before that we really do belong to each other. That there is a way in which we are all, you know, one, despite our, uh, our, the rancor of our political and cultural differences. So again, it doesn't just clues you together. It, it, it creates a bigger container that can hold all the uh, the different worldviews in, in a much more roomy way. And so the feeling of inclusion uh, definitely diminishes fear and rancor and a sense of hate. The other part, the transcendent part, is that there's a, a feeling of liberation that comes from, in a sense, um, uh, being, being liberated from the progressive postmodern uh, uh, expectation right? The, 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 the sometimes tyrannical social norms of political correctness who feel like that if we say the wrong word, we're going to get canceled, you know, in, 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 in environments that are, that are uh, public. And so the, the liberation from that, you know, we can still recognize progressivism, not just for its tyranny, but also for its beauty. But at the same time, we're no longer cowed by it. We're no longer guilted by it because we're establishing a moral system, a moral view that's even more moral than the progressive one. So there's there's this sense of um, the sense of belonging, the sense of well-being, and this sense of excitement about future possibilities. Again, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. So we're drawing to a close. Thank you so much to Steve, to Jeff, 
and to Diane and for everyone who's been here contributing questions and some fantastic comments in the chat. Um, would either of you three have any closing thoughts as we draw this to an end? Well, I can say that rebel wisdom is a beautiful fruit of the spirit that I've admired it since it first emerged. And I want to congratulate you, David, on, on and your colleagues on creating something that's really important for our culture. And it's been an honor to um, to be on your program. Here, here. Same. Thank you, David. Thanks for your work. Thanks for your your willingness to bring people together and their sameness and their differences. Well, I wouldn't be able to do it if um, it wasn't that people kept saying yes to my invites to come on and to be interviewed. So as long as that keeps happening, then um, we'll carry on making films and events like this. So thank you so much. And as we traditionally do at the end of these calls, everyone would like to unmute themselves and we will say thank you, goodbye, and see you soon for another one of these. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho hamilton John Viveki, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>